Hello everybody, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. Uh, we're here with Dr. Keith Suda, but before we do that, Lucy, can you please do the acknowledgement of country? Yes, thank you, David, and um, thank you, Keith. I'd just like us to think about the land that we're on at the moment. Uh, we're actually made of it, and there were people that looked after it for a long time before we got here, and I just want to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging, because I know the local ones here on Gaib or Jarraware lands, not only do they uh, give us welcome, but they also not acknowledge our ancestors and us and who's coming after us. And I just thank them for the wisdom that they do uh, pass on if we uh, want to avail ourselves of that because they know that to move into the future we all need to do that together so thank you thank you and to add to that we're going to be hearing about the club of rome and they talk about the need to listen to all voices including those of indigenous people i'd like to introduce our guest dr keith suda he has achieved three doctorates on the international law of guerrilla warfare, on social and economic consequences of the arms race, and a third on scenario planning. He has been appointed to many prestigious roles throughout his career, including chairperson of the International Humanitarian Law Committee of Australian Red Cross in New South Wales, chairperson of the International Commission of Jurists, New South Wales, director of studies at the International Law Association, the Australian branch, managing director of the Global Directions Think Tank, He's also a member of the prestigious Club of Rome since 1993, which will be a focus of our talk. So, Dr. Suda, please take it away. Thank you. Now, what is it that you'd like me to explain the Club of Rome and what we're about? Yes, that'd be great. Yeah. So the Club of Rome um, was started in a public way back in 1972. Back in 1968, um, there were uh, meetings between Aurelio Pachai who was an Italian industrialist and one of the people responsible for the post-war economic recovery of Italy as a modern industrial democratic state. And Alexander King, um, who was uh, from Britain and had had a number of, of government posts, was then at the Organization for the Economic Cooperation and Development, which is based in Paris, basically the club of rich Western countries. These two individuals had been reflecting separately on the nature of economic growth within society. Remember, we were recovering from the war. Um, well, at, least, at least I remember that. I, I was brought up immediately after World War II. Uh, recovering from the war, the economists were ticking over very nicely. And these two people, quite separately, asked, what are the implications for the environment? Now, in those days, nobody talked about the environment. Um, the UN Charter, for example, does not contain the word environment. Uh, environment was mainly um, um, a matter of preserving historic houses and castles, etc. Um, there was some move towards cleaning up the air um, and reducing the amount of toxic pollution going into rivers. But basically, people were just so happy enjoying their wealth that nobody actually said, well, what's it going to do to the, the land, if you like? It's the issue that's just been raised with Lucy. Um, and so these two people meeting together in Buenos Aires at a conference, realizing that they were thinking on the same uh, terms and realizing also that computers had been invented, decided to uh, finance a study uh, of a number of young students, some of whom are still alive, to look at what would be the long term consequences of continued high rate of economic growth. What will it do to the consumption of resources, the pollution of the air, pollution of the sea, et cetera? And that book, their report to this Club of Rome uh, was published in, in 1972. The Club of Rome, let me explain, is not connected with the Roman Catholic Church. It's not something out of a Dan Brown novel. Um, instead, uh, Aurelio Pachai, uh, head of Fiat, was based in Rome and so, said, well, look, we'll create a think tank, which in those days was a very new idea. We were based it in Rome. We'll call it the Club of Rome. Now, of course, you have a Club of Madrid, Club of Budapest, et cetera. It's very fashionable also to create your own think tank, uh, like Tony Blair has done in retirement or Bill Clinton, et cetera. But this was very much a pioneering move. And the report to the Club of Rome looked at the what they called the limits to growth. 
namely that if the world continued with a high rate of economic growth, then we would end up with immense environmental catastrophe and, the, and we would exhaust uh, the easily available resources, etc. This was a highly controversial document in 1972. It was attacked by both the left and the right. So the left um, said that Karl Marx had assured them that all problems could be solved by technology, therefore don't worry about the environment. And the right said all problems could be solved by the market. So don't worry about the environment. And so criticism from both ends meant that the Limits to Growth report was the biggest selling book on the environment in world history. Millions of copies were sold around the world, thanks to criticism from both the left and the right. But unfortunately, it did give rise also to this suspicion that the Club of Rome was a very sinister group, a cabal, uh, getting ready to take over the world. So if you Google us on YouTube, etc., you'll see some of that conspiracy theory stuff. It's basically 100 individuals concerned about what's going on in the world and want to think about the world's problems in three ways. So one is that the thinking goes across disciplines. The problem with academics, they get to know more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. They're over-specialized. The Club of Rome brings together political scientists like myself, um, economists, uh, business people, et cetera, and environmentalists, of course, all to take a more holistic view of it. So number one, they think across disciplines. Number two, they think across national lines. So we, we talk about the future of the globe or the future of Europe rather than individual countries. And then thirdly, we think long term. The problem with politicians is that they have the concentration span of a fleet. And so what we're wanting to do is just to look long term. And the fate of the Club of Rome report, the first one, Mr. Growth, is a good example of this. So the report was published in 1972. So next year will be the 50th anniversary of that report. And yet we've lost 50 years that could have been spent in making changes to our way of life. Instead, what we've seen is an environmental crisis, which is uh, just uh, in, by many estimations continuing to get worse and worse. So we see the exhaustion of uh, easily available resources, overfishing in the sea, for example. You could scrap half the world's fishing fleet and still catch the same number of fish. So we have too many fishers chasing too few fish. Similarly with the issues as we're looking at, um, as we speak on questions related to the climate uh, uh, crisis that we've got. So these were warnings that were given 50 years ago, but politicians weren't interested. Politicians would say, I've got to win an election next year. I'm not going to worry about something 50 years time. I may not be around that, that far into the future. And so the Club of Rome tries to take this long-term view and, and deal with the big picture. Let me just conclude with making a comment, I think, about the next big paradigm shift. So uh, a fish doesn't know that it swims in water. And so we don't realise that we've grown up in the last 500 years with a particular sort of worldview. And it's what the philosophers call reductionism. So with reductionism, we keep on breaking every subject down. So in my field, political science, we now, the field is so big, so complex, that we break it down. So we have international relations specialists, political theories, political philosophers, etc. So we're more and more specialists. My guess is that the next big paradigm shift will be to focus on complexity and complexity theory. And we are acquiring a more sophisticated knowledge about how the world works. Now, Indigenous people have known this for millennia, right? I'm just intrigued by the work done by Dr. Susan Simar in uh, Canada. Uh, and she talks about how trees communicate with each other and how they assist one another. So when a, a human walks into a forest, the trees are talking to each other. They're not talking uh, using words, but instead they're sending signals through their root system. And so we're beginning to realize that when you cut down a mother tree, as she calls them, a very big old tree in a forest, you're actually disrupting the lives of a lot of other trees around it. So we're actually getting a greater sense of of complexity. Now, if I take the example of Australia's Indigenous peoples, um, I recently came across a program of lectures given at Oxford uh, 
And this was in actually 1972. And I'm listed there as one of the presenters. And in those days, um, I was talking about the human rights of indigenous peoples before I came to Australia. I came to Australia in 1973. Um, thankfully, no record exists of what I had to say, because I'm sure I'd be embarrassed because our knowledge of indigenous people in Australia has, has increased so much in the last 50 years. But what we're also realizing is that they had a much more complex and sophisticated understanding of how you coexist with your environment but by being a member of the environment rather than the white fellows who come out, cut down trees, do all sorts of damage, etc. So the Club of Rome is trying to tap into obviously indigenous wisdom and looking at other ways of thinking about the world. Now, the problem is that it's very difficult to make that a nice, short, snappy headline for the front page of a newspaper. Um, you know, the, the things that really affect our lives will not be reported on the front page of the newspaper. They deal with immediate, short, sharp stories. I work in the media, so I know how we operate. As in fact, we've got these deep underlying structural issues which bubble along from one decade to the next. And that's where the, a lot of the problems are, but they're not being properly addressed. Um, and so the issues like the complexity of thinking need, I think, to get far more publicity and to see how issues are interconnected with one another, um, sometimes called the, the butterfly effect. You know, the old argument that a butterfly fluttering its wings over the Amazon creates a storm over New York. Um, and so just getting to see the interconnectedness of issues that and that sophisticated worldview you see amongst Australia's indigenous people. Um, and we are only now just very slowly coming round to acknowledging that point of view. So I'll leave it at that point, but I'm very happy to have questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Lucy, you have some questions, comments. Yes, uh, thank you for that great overview, um, Dr. Suda. Um, I'm just interested in the Club of Rome because, you know, I had heard of it before and um, did a little bit of research. And uh, from what I can see, um, there's like 100, it's limited to 100 members. So I was wondering if you could comment on what the mechanism is, um, like those 100 members, they must have um, people that advise them or, you know, what sort of methods yeah. um, are in a place for, um, you know, the information to come in a sense from the ground up um, to those people and the mechanism of that and the mechanism of how the Club of Rome 100 members communicate with each other. So the number is kept at around about 100 because it is a club. Um, it, it's not a mass membership organisation um, and it, it doesn't seek to draw in huge numbers of people. A problem with a mass membership organisation is that you just simply have to expend so much energy just simply maintaining that membership. Instead, we are a think tank, not a mass membership. But we're obviously looking for um, mass appeal without being mass membership. So the membership is by invitation. So somebody will notice you. In my case, Alexander King on a trip to Australia uh, was at a meeting which was convened here and we got talking and he was very much concerned about the need to have in those days, this is 30 years ago, the younger people and particularly those with a media background. Because a lot of the people who were then in the Club of Rome were people who were not necessarily adept at handling the media. They were very good at running big corporations or government departments they weren't necessarily working in the media. And so it's my work in the media that attracted Alexander King. So one of the roles that I used to play at our annual conferences was to write out the communique from the conference. In other words, these are the issues that were discussed. These were the big themes. These are the matters that need further consideration, etc. So I was using my media skills in that role. Um, we're seeing um, a change in the membership because originally the members were a male and white and elderly, uh, namely that they're people who reach the top of their profession, not so much in my case, but certainly in the case of others. Um, I remember being at one meeting when I asked the person what he did for a living, he said he sold cars, which is true, he was selling cars, he was the head of Volkswagen. Uh, so, so you've got these industrialists, etc. You've got some industrialists out there who do have a conscience and do want to work for a better society, 
um, perhaps reduce the amount of nagging they get from their grandchildren about what's going on with the environment, et cetera. So there are a variety of motivations as to why people get involved um, uh, with the organizations. They say you have to be invited, but our conferences are held in public, um, of course, without COVID. Um, so two years ago, our last in-person conference uh, was held in South Africa. Um, which was very interesting. I got to meet the great grandson of Nelson Mandela, which is an interesting experience in itself. Uh, so that was open to the general public. Um, so uh, the conferences that we hold are open to the public, um, despite what you might hear from, you know, the people who read Dan Brown novels. It's not a conspiracy. Um, it's a way of just trying to get people to think long term and think about these bigger issues. And the people that we try to recruit are ones with that sort of mindset. Now, my role um, has been over the last 30 years, when I get this information, I then use it in my radio and TV. As you may know, I'm on radio on average once a day in Australia. And of course, I'm on TV, Channel 7. Um, so I, I use those platforms as a way of publicizing the Club of Rome material. So I see myself as a publicist. Others are there because they are experts in environmental issues or they're as economists. Uh, etc. And so it's these annual gatherings, plus the uh, more frequent regional ones, are very important ways of, of getting your head around these really big ideas, which as I say, they're neglected in most of the mainstream media at the moment, as we record this, obviously a lot of attention being given to the climate crisis because of Glasgow, but eventually the interest there will subside and we will have other issues moving along onto the front page. And how does the 100 members make sure they're sort of hearing from everybody on the ground? Do they, I imagine they have different, uh, different approaches. Well, they do have different approaches. They have different sources of information because it depends on their professional outlook. In my case, of course, I do talk back radio, so I get to hear what Australians have to say <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, and um, they're, they're not there to represent people, though. It's, it's not a parliament. It's a think tank. And so the, the purpose of the think tank is to say to people, these are issues that you might want to think about, rather than saying, I've spoken to my constituency. That's the role of a parliamentarian or a member of Congress. And the Club of Rome is not shaped like that. It doesn't purport to say, I have a constituency and I'm speaking on behalf of that constituency. Instead, we're entrepreneurs of ideas and we're focusing on those ideas. We're listening for the faint signals of change we're trying to identify the issues that people ought to be thinking about rather than saying, I have a constituency and I'm here to represent my constituency. You mentioned um, that there was in the 1970s, there was that uh, sort of groundbreaking report. And then here we are 50 years later. Do you remain optimistic that we can do something or is it always going to be this kind of people are going to warn that we need to do something and then most people will go, look, I've got other things I need to focus on right now. Well, there is certainly an element of that still. Um, and as H.G. Wells said, everything in life is a race between education and disaster. So, um, yes, we've always got this risk of, of disaster. Obviously, from a theological point of view, as you may know, I've written quite a bit, few books on Armageddon. Um, I've been drawn into the Armageddon debate because of my work with the Club of Rome, because I've had conservatives saying, yes, we agree with you. The earth is going to be destroyed. That's good news. You shouldn't be stopping climate change. Bring it on. The Messiah will return once you have more and more bad news. We don't want to have people like you stopping climate change. We want to increase it. We want to have more plagues, more pestilence, more children dying, etc. So that's how I, that's one of the areas in which I've been involved. The whole, as I say, I've written quite a few books on the whole issue of Armageddon theology. Um, and, and so you, you within Christian terms, um, I'm coming across a lot of this end of the world thinking, namely the Club of Rome is preventing the Messiah from returning. In secular terms, I come across it a lot with uh, um, the environment movement, particularly the deep green end of the environment movement, who are saying, look, we're, like, we're finished. We're, let's get out of here. So um, we've got um, the guy who does the report from the Dark Mountain, I'm trying to think of his name, who's now moved from England. He was an environmental activist very well-known um, uh, activist. And he has said, look, we're finished. 
We're moving across to the Republic of Ireland, the Gael Tart, which is on the western coast of Ireland. Um, and we're going to be growing our own vegetables, make our own clothes and homeschooling our own children because the world is finished. So there is quite a bit of that sort of end of the world thinking going on both in religious circles and also in secular circles as well. So when you get people in the Club of Rome coming along saying, no, it, it is um, a responsibility uh, of us to work for a better world, for the stewardship of resources, etc. cetera, um, then we get criticism from a number of different angles. I don't mind that. You know, I've, I've, I learned to do my public speaking as a teenager at Speaker's Corner in London. Now, if you can cope with one of those rowdy audiences, you can cope with anybody. So as a teenager, I learned to do with rough crowds. Um, and that gives me great confidence. So I'm not worried about the extent of criticism, but I've had over the years in which I was employed in the Uniting Church, I've had people saying, well, that person should be sacked from the Uniting Church for being such a dangerous person with his views. Uh, so I've, I've had controversy surrounding me for many decades, and then being linked to the Club of Rome has only had to, my, to that amount of controversy. Indeed. Lucy, did you have something to say? Yeah, I'm just linking a couple of threads here, um, mentioning the Glasgow gathering, as we could call it. Um, yes, I do have a, a personal friend there, a Christian Aboriginal elder, uh, Reverend Ray Minicon, over oh, there. I was doing a <laughs> Zoom with Ray only a few weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, he's sort of like a bit heartbroken um, at his experience of visiting the Australian pavilion, I guess you could call it. Um, and there's absolutely no reference to Indigenous peoples there at all. Um, after all this time and everything that we've been through, you know, the progress, the momentum that, you know, we felt was being. Um, you know, uh, gathering here. Um, so there's that. Then um, there is, you're mentioning that the report from 50 years ago from the Club of Rome was not met, uh, you know, was met with a lot of criticism, etc. And people haven't listened to those warnings. So you've got two instances there of, you know, like not listening, not going with something that, you know, seems to be very important for a more cooperative human future, I guess you could say. And then the mainstream um, media, uh, which I, you know, have respect that you're involved with, etc. cetera. Um, but it seems as though that, yes, people aren't really listening. So do you know anything um, that the Club of Rome is doing uh, to use other communication methods. I mean, here we're talking about the Christian faith where you have um, small groups, you have a lot of hope, um, you know, at the basis of our faith. Um, how is that hope, in a sense, being communicated? And how are these prophetic warnings, in a sense, not being listened to? And what's being uh, done about that? Of course, prophetic warnings being ignored is nothing new. <laughs> we think of Amos and Hosea in the Old Testament. Um, the Club of Rome um, is certainly undergoing its own communications revolution. So it was uh, previously very much text-based, so it produced these reports. The problem is people don't read long documents nowadays. I know editors who don't read long books either. Um, now, I'm addicted to books, as you can probably see around uh, this office here. Uh, so I'm a great believer in still reading books. But um, just having books there is and publishing them, I don't think is quite enough. And in the case of Limits to Growth, we've produced a series, and we continue, go to the Club of Rome website, clubofrome.org, and you can see the reports are still being produced. Um, so that process continues. Um, nothing quite as good as the Limits to Growth. That was outstanding. It's very difficult to lay a second golden egg. But it has also meant that we've had to get into the social media, um, we're also, of course, using other forms of uh, more ele electronic communication as well. They've just recently taken on board a, a young communications expert, Philippa, um, who's um, going to be also looking at this Club of Rome profile. Because you're right, Lucy, that the Club of Rome is producing good material, but not enough people will get to hear about it. Um, and we've just got to get the stuff out into the mainstream, but it's now much more difficult because the nature of broadcasting has changed. Well, for a start, broadcasting is gone. Uh, broadcasting was the transmission of signals 
from a small number of stations to a large number of people. We've now gone to an era of narrow casting, which means that we have a large number of stations transmitting to a small number of people. So here in Sydney, for example, if somebody tells me what radio station they listen to, I know automatically know quite a bit about them because I know that people are attracted to particular narrow casting stations, same with newspapers, etc. So in the old days, like back in 1972, Limits to Growth, you could put out a document which would then run across the media. If you go onto the Club of Rome website, you can see a lovely documentary from that era, uh, old fashioned photography and all the rest of it, um, which shows you the type of, of coverage which they were then getting in the media. But the problem is today, we've got uh, far less attention to big picture items, which is what I've already commented upon. And people now, particularly with social media, tend to have very short concentration spans. We're actually, there, there is a debate that's going on as to whether or not we're actually rewiring our brains. Now, that, again, this is not a new issue. If you go back to Plato, so we're now talking about 3,000 years ago, Plato, or 2,500 years ago, Plato argued that people should not be taught to read and write. In other words, that they had to keep everything in their memory, a bit like Australia's Indigenous culture. It was stored up here. They didn't go around with notebooks. It was all stored up here and then relayed from one generation to another in what's called an oral culture. Um, now we're in a debate about what we've obviously learned to read and write and literacy is now widespread. Um, but we're, we're no longer getting the same sort of memories that people would have had in an oral culture. In an oral culture, you hear something once and that's it. You forget it, you're in trouble. Whereas I come across people who are forever making notes on their mobile phone or on bits of paper, et cetera. Um, and so it is very difficult to try to communicate with people where, that, where they've got a fragmented perception of reality. And it's just one sensation after another, a cat video followed by video footage of a massacre in Africa, et cetera. It's actually very difficult to try to communicate fully with people. May I also go one step beyond, which is a, a bit heretical for a, an academic like myself. The, the assumption that we make with education is that people will think their way through to a new way of living. So in other words, we expose um, youngsters to novels and they then learn uh, from the experience of the people in the novels and hopefully become better adults. So they, they're doing their thinking and then it changes behavior. I'm not convinced now about that. Um, you come across medical professionals, for example, who know the dangers of smoking, but they still smoke. So my view is that you don't think your way through to a new way of living, you live your way through to a new way of thinking. In other words, that as the climate catastrophe gets worse, to use the example you've raised, Lucy of Glasgow, as the climate catastrophe gets worse, then I think people will move into a new way of living um, because they've got this new way of thinking being forced upon them. And the Club of Rome has argued that the 20th century will be called the century of economics because it was in that century we worked out how you get economic growth, made some sort of mixed economy. Um, so the 20th century, the century of economics, the 21st century is the century of the environment uh, because you are having to come to terms with all that excessive economic growth. And so the environment will force itself upon us and we will be forced to change our way of thinking and become more reconciled to the need to protect the environment. But then it goes back to my earlier point with H.G. Wells, who said everything in life is a race between education and disaster. Will people make the change in time or will we end up with a, a really bad future particularly for the children and grandchildren coming through now. Do you think they'll make the change? Do I think people will make the change? I hope they will. I'm an optimist, right? Um, as Jürgen Moltmann said, um, we are, as Christians, we are commanded to hope. So we have to be hopeful people. We have to convey hopefulness in what we say and how we act on a daily basis. Um, but I am aware that um, with all this exploration of outer space we have never yet come across other life forms and i'm aware that some scientists are saying well there is a, a form of evolution that goes on in in the universe and you reach a certain level and you just destroy yourself you wipe yourself out 
And it's worth bearing in mind that there are more extinct civilizations than currently thriving ones. Uh, like the Roman Empire has gone, the Aztecs, etc. Those empires have gone, those ways of living. Um, so if, if you're a gambling person, as a Methodist, of course, I'm not. But if you're a gambling person, you'd have to say, hmm, I'm not sure what the odds are for our surviving. <laughs> what do you tell I say? I'm hopeful. So, I, you know, I just continue to work. You said before about some environmentalists think we're done for you've got some religious people saying we're done for what do you say to the environmentalists when they when they say that to you well the fact is you can't reply with any sort of a reasonable amount of information because only the future will tell us which which, which way of thinking was correct um we can point to certain improvements in the, in our way of life um i'm a londoner i grew up in world war ii so I've, I have, like everybody who lived in London after World War II, I've got emphysema. Small amount, but I've got it. Why? Because we burnt so much coal in London. And you used to get these pea super fogs that you see in the Hollywood movies, you know, the murderers creeping around. And these. I can remember a time when you, you could not see the other side of the street. You could hardly see more than about a yard in front of you because of this yellow fog. That's now gone. It's, uh, and you can actually now go back to catching fish in the River Thames uh, in central London. So there have been improvements, but I, I would have to say that if you're discussing the future of the world with a, a gloomy environmentalist, uh, my, there's nothing I could say would win that person over, and there's nothing that person can say is going to win me over. We just have to wait to see what the future holds for us. And is that the same with the ones that say Armageddon's coming, that's a good thing? Well, um, my reply to that is from the Olivet Discourse in Matthew, where Jesus said that no one knows the hour or the time. And so I simply say, look, um, I've worked for the Uniting Church, Methodist Church, Uniting Church for over 40 years. Um, I'm in the publicity department, not the decision making one. Lucy, did you have a question, Tommy? Uh, yes. Um, it yeah, just um, carrying on for that, yeah, it's not about intellectual persuasion as such, um, which leads me on to thinking of what you were talking about, about living your way into, uh, living into the new way, not just um, thinking about it. And yeah, because I'm a bit similar, I talk act your way into a new way of thinking instead of thinking your way into a new way of acting. So very, very similar there. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I take a lot of uh, comfort, I guess, in a sense, um, from a lot of um, the recent research that's been done on the relationship between the heart and the brain so you know our um in, not so much just our emotional intelligence but physiologically that you know the uh, electric fields and all that sort of stuff around it are much 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 more powerful than the brain they're always measuring you know brain uh, activity etc but the heart actually gives impulses to the brain it's not the brain just organizing everything in our body so a lot of people don't sort of realize that or that this research is going on so that sort of brings us back to the faith thing because you know there's a lot of things that uh, Jesus said about the heart the importance of the heart it wasn't only about the mind so that's why you know it's heart mind you know everything about us um, that should be involved in you know a flourishing life um, so um, yeah I was just thinking about that um, in terms of reaching people um, not just through the intellectual persuasion mainstream media but heart to heart with people and I think again it's you know the grassroots there's a lot of power people don't realize the power that we as individuals have and that we, we as individuals join together things so we can have the external um, uh, things that affect us like you were saying um, the environment forcing us uh, you know to live differently but also um, there are things if we um, communicate heart to heart so that brings it to a more social thing so could you comment a little bit further on what perhaps you and your colleagues in the um, Club of Rome are doing as far as people on the ground communicating the heart faith all those kinds of things yes the club of rome of course is a secular organization it doesn't push, uh, push any particular point of view and it's, as i've said it's not connected with the vatican although we did ironically a few years ago have a conference hosted at the vatican um because the, the current pope has had some 
good things about the environment. So we had our conference at the Vatican. Uh, I might just say as a little um, uh, thing to ponder that one of the presenters um, who spoke to us pointed out to us that a few yards down the corridor, there was this Michelangelo uh, ceiling, which has um, Adam receiving life from God. And this presenter then took Adam's, uh, so he's getting the life from the, from the left finger from God. His right hand is resting on his thigh, but through digital enhancement, this Michelangelo uh, picture was altered so that the human Adam was then actually touching our successor, which is a computer. It, it was a brilliant presentation. Uh, as I say, we were only yards away from the original Sistine Chapel. Um, but we're not, as I say, we're not officially associated with the Club of Rome or any other religion. What you're saying uh, reminds me very much about the work that we do in the Methodist Church about small groups and that the importance of the networking that goes on and networking in a variety of contexts. Remember, the Club of Rome is a club. So it's seen, therefore, as a group of individuals who then come together. They know each other. We're on Christian name terms, et cetera. Even if you're former heads of government, they always insist on these uh, Christian name terms, et cetera. Um, so we are very friendly at that, if you like, the, the group of 100. But we also encourage when people go back to their own countries um, that they also do all that networking. So networking is a form of social capital. And we know that uh, if people are going to have any impact in society, they need to have a lot of social capital. In other words, the personal connections. Another term here is the power of weak links. In other words, instead of just having the same old handful of people that you meet with on a regular basis, you try to meet with a variety of people. And so that, that's the strength of the weak links. And so that goes back again to the role of personal example. I think also on the question of personal example, I might say that I've never owned a car. Um, so I'm somebody who got the environment bug quite early. Back, ironically, in 1972, um, I was on, uh, as a, a young person, I was on the uh, UN Association Youth Committee in Great Britain planning for the Stockholm Environment Conference. So 1972 was a key year for the environment. You had limits to growth and the first of these really big international conferences. Um, and that was on the UN conference on the human environment in Stockholm. Um, and so I was introduced to the environmental issue quite early on uh, through this element of personal connection. And that has really stayed with me. So I agree with Lucy about the importance of personal connection, just spreading the word informally. Now I'm lucky because I work in the media and so my views can go out through the mainstream media, et cetera, and through podcasts, which is a whole new era of broadcasting now through global truths. Um, so I'm doing broadcasting as well, but also it's this element of the personal connection and people trust people when they can see them in the flesh. I might just say, um, in 1982, I was appointed the General Secretary of the Uniting Churches Assembly Commission on Social Responsibility. And a particularly big issue that year was the nuclear arms race. And uh, so the Uniting Church took a very strong line in opposing nuclear weapons. Now very fashionable, but it wasn't back in 1982. And the Bulletin, uh, which was then a, a, a weekly conservative news magazine in Australia, did an article on the new left's new power bases. And I was one of those identified as part of the new left. Um, it didn't get very far with the Uniting Church because a lot of Uniting Church congregations said, but we've had this person speaking to us on a Sunday. He doesn't look like new left to me. He doesn't dress like the new left even. So, so it is that personal contact, which was very important with this previous controversy back in 1982. And with the... Oh, sorry, sorry. Go you go, David. I was just going to say, with the complexity of the issues, and that's like across the board with any issue, and you said the difficulty in getting people to understand issues are complex, how can you change that? Or are we just kind of hardwired to, it needs to be simplistic? Um, well, there is an element of our being hardwired because we like to simplify life. And life is just so complex. So if you go back to the earlier part of the environment debate back in the 1970s, we talked about the population bomb. Um, not so much Club of Rome, that was Paul Ehrlich. Uh, 
Um, and he was talking about too many people in the world. Um, therefore, the argument was, well, we've got to do much to reduce population. I'm now doing radio programs on the risk of running out of people. China, for example, may grow old before it grows rich. And China is our major customer. Uh, so we're running, Japan is running out of people. Uh, Russia is running out of people. Um, so it shows how you solve one problem, but then you create others, which is why the Club of Rome back in 1972 talked about the global problematique. In other words, how all these issues feed into one another. And if you look at the current agenda of the Club of Rome, they're dealing with um, emergence from emergency. In other words, how do we, well, to use the American expression, build back better. Um, issues of new ways of doing economics, obviously, the whole climate issue, and also how do we mobilize young people? They're the future. You know, dinosaurs like myself are on the way out. Uh, how do we mobilize the young people, get them involved? So what we're trying to do is to show how interrelated, how interconnected all these issues are. Um, and that is a tough job, which is why after 50 years, we're still talking about the limits of growth report because of the lack of progress which has been made. But it doesn't mean that we stop. It just means we have to find new ways of trying to have an impact. Yeah, I think that um, the cross across the generations conversations um, are really, really important. Um, I was at a breakfast for um, women, uh, Christian women in uh, influential roles, I guess, or leadership type roles. Um, in the local community up here and uh, had a conversation with a young female criminologist at the local uni here and uh, she wasn't in uh, what you call regular uh, Christian fellowship as such she was relying on girlfriends um, you know some of them in the face some of them not and also um, her circle of friends was people who you possibly would consider as outcasts from you know mainstream uh, church, conservative church groups etc and she was doing podcasts etc and was uh, experiencing what a lot of people do on as you say these um, more uh, small groups um, you know echo chambers I guess you could call them you know people sort of listening to like voices um, which you do get um, as you said in the mainstream um, media where you know you've got your you know groups listening to their certain um, broadcasters etc or narrow casters as you mentioned um, and but she came along to this breakfast because she was looking for in a sense um, a sense of solidarity um, hope all that kind of thing um, and so I think what you were saying is very important you know a younger person um, coming into contact because there are a lot of um, different uh, nationalities uh, represented at this breakfast and age groups so I think that diversity factor is very important um, so could you say a little bit more about the cross-generational uh, conversation and the importance of diversity in these conversations well my favorite example uh, emphasizing the importance of diversity is not Club of Rome it's actually Nokia so Nokia used to be a fine Finnish company uh, it's gone through a few ups and downs. It's bouncing back a bit at the moment. But 30 odd years ago, um, Nokia um, was working on a new technology called texting. So they made their name with mobile phones. They were the biggest supplier of mobile phones until iPhone came along from Apple. Um, and Nokia in Finland was run by a group of elderly white engineers, male engineers. But they were smart enough to know they weren't smart enough to know everything. And so they employed a group of teenage advisors. And so everything they developed, they would then show to these teenagers and say, what do you make of this? And so Nokia invented a facility called texting. But the old men couldn't get it to work because they've got slow, fat fingers. I've got slow, fat fingers, so I don't send text messages. Uh, but they, they showed it to the prototype to the group of teenage advisors. And there was a 15-year-old Finnish schoolboy who realised that Nokia had solved the basic problem of 15-year-olds throughout history. How do you invite, invite a girl out on a date? You text her. So he said to Nokia, continue with this experiment. I think you're onto something. And of course, this day, 7 billion text messages will be sent around the world. Um, so here you had a 15-year-old 
who could see something that the stale pale males couldn't see. And this for me is the value of a workforce, which, or anything else, including a discussion group, consists of men and women, young and old, black and white, because they, everybody looks at the world differently. Remember I'm talking earlier about this issue of paradigms. What's the next big paradigm? Uh, moving from reductionism to some sort of more holistic complexity theory-based approach to life. Um, so everybody brings their own particular paradigms. And the paradigms begin to develop at the moment of birth, some might say even before a, a, the baby is born. They're already developing different ways of looking at the world, making sense of the world. Um, and we need those variety of viewpoints. Um, and that's what the Club of Rome set out to do 50 years ago with limits to growth, that although it tended to um, recruit just an elite because they're the ones who could afford to fly to these international conferences, but they were nonetheless aware of their limitations. They sought to invite other people, um, including at one point they had a group called TT30, Think Tank 30, for you know, people aged under 30. So uh, recruiting groups of people expressly because they were young men and women. Um, so you, absolutely, we need to get this diversity of viewpoints. I might just say, if you look at the Australian Parliament at the moment, the lack of diversity there, the groupthink that goes on, um, whereas we really ought to be open to new ideas. Um, and, and so that's what's going to help us get into this new era, new ways of thinking. Yeah, and we've certainly seem to have this discrimination both ways because I've heard older people say they feel sidelined, you know, in same workplaces. And I've also heard younger people who are leaders who feel that they're not being taken seriously because they're young, which is unhelpful. And I heard a talk from a, a lady who said, oh, we don't want to hire older people because, you know, they're going to retire soon. So why train them? And she was trying to get them to do new thinking and say, well, even if you hired a younger person, they might change their career in a couple of years anyway, or their job in a couple of years. So it's the same kind of thing. Can I ask you a little bit about the rethinking finance and economics? Yeah, so what we're looking at, obviously, um, is trying to find an alternative to the current system of economic growth. Um, so, for example, one of the um, reports that we put out is on the circular economy. So if you take something, the standard example um, is the humble little coffee bean, right? I've got my coffee here. That's what keeps me going during the day. Now... 99% of a coffee bean is thrown away. Only one, less than 1% of a coffee bean is actually used. The rest is discarded. So if you're thinking in terms of a circular economy, how can you make something of that 99%? Now, you, you can't give the coffee grains directly to pigs because it makes them high. Uh, but what you can do is you grow mushrooms, which you can eat yourself, or you feed to the pigs. So um, companies are now creating whole new industries based on getting much more out of what we currently are using. Um, another example would be uh, the future of automobiles, um, that uh, you will not buy an automobile, you'll basically rent it. And at the end of the life of the automobile, you'll simply ring up the company and say, come and take it away. Now, that gives an incentive to the company to make the automobile of components, which they can then recycle and not just put on the junk heap. So that's just one very small example about what the Club of Rome is talking about. So that's the circular economy. Um, and that's um, clearly one of the ways that we've got to move forward. We're not going to say to that everybody's got to go back to living in caves or anything like that, because you'll get nowhere with that. Uh, but what you've got to do is to think about how you can actually then to start to reinvent the economy so it works for the benefit of humankind rather than just a handful of shareholders. So you think that like simple living is kind of not the approach that's going to work? Let's all just sort of be very, consume nothing, be very simple in our living, but that's not going to work. We have to find ways to kind of re-engineer. I think so. I think if we can get people off their addiction to consumerism, which is a new invention, Traditionally, we have not had consumerism within societies. That's been invented in the last few decades to keep people working. So there's always a carrot in front of them. So they always have to go on and get a new iPhone each year or whatever. Um, so what we've got to do, perhaps, is to change our way of thinking so that people are less addicted to um, buying things and focusing on experiences.
because there's a whole new uh, level of economic activities uh, operating. So if you think about it, your traditional three layers of economic activity were um, the farming or extracting goods from the, the soil like coal, iron. Then the next level was manufacturing. And then the, the next level up is the service sector. So going to the local greasy spoon to get a cup of coffee. We're now at the fourth level, which is called the experience economy. So experiences are abstract rather than something that I buy. So if you go to Starbucks, for example, Starbucks sells you coffee. You can get that at the greasy spoon, but Starbucks says, oh, no, this is the third place in your life. You have home, you have work, you have Starbucks. So you can sit in Starbucks all day on your computer, generating brilliant new ideas, et cetera. So Starbucks is part of that experience economy. Um, so that's where the economic growth is. And that doesn't require quite so much consumption of resources because um, we're actually in, trying to enrich people's lives. And the, I think the market for experience is basically unlimited. Unlike, say, an automobile, when you can only have, you can only be driving one car at a time. Even if you have a garage full of them, you can only drive one at a time. Whereas with experiences, you can go on and having a variety of experiences. So that may well be, a, and, and if you look at the Australian economy, for example, we are digging up a lot of coal to sell overseas. Um, whereas we, I think the growth would be much more in terms of the experience economy. Tourism, bringing people into this country, letting them see what we have by way of our culture, our environment, et cetera. And from that point of view, it's important that we have Indigenous people at uh, pavilions at international conferences to advertise, uh, you know, part of the visiting Australia would be to be exposed to the Indigenous way of life. So they're an important part of tourism, which I've seen in parts of Queensland when I've been travelling, etc. There's a lot more we can do to develop that. Yeah, yeah. I think there needs to be a bit of a royal commission into what of those lower levels of economic thinking contribute to that experience one what's holding you know what's holding that up all the uh, resources that go into for example travel etc I think a multilateral uh, approach is always helpful I mean the Anabaptists um, look at you know living much more simply you know um, being more one I guess with the environment than um, just exploiting it etc but I do agree with you I've seen those um, you know changes in the economic thinking and outworking um, over a while um, I remember that you know back there was the old future shock book by Alvin Toffler back in 1970 and you know some of those things have come true and some of those things have come through in different ways than he expected and of course some of them have already run their cycles um, but yeah I think um, it, it's it's also tied into what you're saying about looking at um, you can dissect things to specialize look how those components work but you've got to see how that they work in together so even with the experience economy um, you know we've got to look at you know all the contributing factors to make that something that is um, not just sustainable but again for the flourishing of us all um, not just human, but also the environment which supports us. Um, so perhaps if you could say um, a little bit more, um, tell us a little bit more about that experience economy and um, how that um, applies to the rest of those economic ways of thinking. Yeah, so um, you, the, the idea of complexity is interesting because it's the difference between a frog and a bicycle. So you can uh, take apart all the components of a bicycle and then reassemble them. You can't do that with a frog. Once you've cut the frog up, you can't stitch it back together again. So what we're looking at, I think, now are new ways of doing finance. Um, it's interesting the extent to which um, you've got the big uh, finance groups who are now well behind on, on the, the whole climate change issue, who are saying, yes, we have a problem. I noticed this because I'm on the corporate speaking circuit and I was intrigued by the number of insurance companies that have taken up the climate change issue. This was years ago. And their argument is that we're doing it simply because the, we can tell from our claims against our policies that there is something happening with the weather. <laughs> 
we've got no choice but to pay attention to climate change. This is at a time when most Australian politicians were just downplaying it as an issue. So and that's, again, if you like, experience changing our way of thinking, because more and more of the finance sector is getting involved in this. Now, in terms of the experience economy, for me, one of the examples coming out of this COVID period has been how we conduct our learning. So we've had, because we're not allowed to meet in education institutions, I teach on the Sydney campus of Boston University, but we've had no American students in Sydney now for a year and a half. Um, now, you can certainly do your teaching online as we are communicating here, and I think it's good. You know, I do adult education and my adult education classes are now much bigger than ever before, simply because we can talk through Zoom and people who are confined at home because of disability, etc., are able now to take part in it. That's the good news with Zoom. But also you do get the experience of actually being in a class with other people. And that goes back to this issue of the experience economy. So as we start to rebuild our international student market, remember that's our third largest export industry. In the case of the state of Victoria, it's the number one export industry. As we start to rebuild uh, the international education market, bringing students into this country once again, we will see the importance of the experience economy because people are mixing together with, with Australia. And I know with my American students coming out to study on the Sydney campus of Boston University, they're not coming out to hear me, they're coming out to go to Bondi Beach. So that's all part of that experience. Um, and we make sure that our students have good experiences while they're here in Australia. Um, so that is part of the experience economy. And that requires, I think, a lot more attention. It's a pity that so much attention is just given to certain other economic activities lower down, if you like, those three layers. We've got to give far more attention to that fourth layer, the experience economy. Now, I'm very mindful of the time. Uh, so I just want to say for people who are watching this or will watch this and say, oh, why didn't... Uh you know, David and Lucy asked Dr. Suda this question or that question. You can still ask these questions. Just let us know the Australian Student Christian Movement and we'll pass them on to Dr. Suda. I also want to mention, you, you made reference to the Sistine Chapel. Brisbane actually has a Sistine Chapel exhibition where they've used uh, special printing technology to print out life-sized uh, images of the Sistine Chapel. Thank you so much, uh, Lucy, for joining. And thank you so much, Dr. Suda, um, for joining. Thank, thank you. you. It's a pleasure right. to